Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 352nd episode, we have a bunch of news, including some stories about dinosaur brains, two new sauropods, and a bunch of other stories. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Aerosteon, and a fun fact about how strong tyrannosaur jaws were at different ages, so how they changed as they grew up. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons, and this week we have two new patrons to thank, and they are Misunderstood Overraptor, which is good because Overraptors are frequently misunderstood, Mm -hmm. like we were just talking about even in the most recent Jurassic World trailer. And our other new patron is Sezisaurus. So thank you both very much for joining this wonderful community. And I believe Sezisaurus was officially the 200th patron. Nice. We're official. <laughs> yep. <laughs> We're officially doing that YouTube Q&A that we totally know when is going to happen. <laughs> soon. <laughs> very soon. Or soon. I don't know if I want to say very soon. But rounding out our shout outs, we've got Wouter. Shane Kylosaurus, Risa, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, JC, Jackson Crawford, Stefan, and Greg. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. We did it. We made it to 200 people, and that's amazing. So thank you for being part of our community. I uh, hope you're enjoying all the perks and getting in on our Discord. And if you're not yet part of our dinosaur enthusiast community, then you can get in on the action. It's patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping into the news, <laughs> there was a paper that recently came out about two brain cases of Despletosaurus, Theropod Tyrannosauridae Anatomy and Comparison, that was published in Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences by Ariana Paulina Carbajal and others. So this team used CT scans to make a 3D construction of two Displetosaurus brain cases. And if you want to know more about Displetosaurus, we did talk about it as a dinosaur of the day in episode 120. And these two specimens they used, the first was the holotype of Displetosaurus taurusus, and that was found in 1921 near Red Deer River, Alberta, and described in 1970 by Dale Russell. And then the second specimen was found in 2001. So these scans helped and reconstructions help show that there's more diversity in these brain cases than previously thought. And it's possible that the specimen found in 2001 could be a different species of Displetosaurus, a new species. How many species of Displetosaurus are there now? Is it just the one? There's also Displetosaurus horneri. And what's this one from 1970? Displetosaurus taurusus. Okay. Yeah. So this specimen hasn't been named yet, but there's some of the authors of the papers that are working on describing it. As a new species? I believe so. Interesting. So one of the things that they pointed out is that we don't have too many analyses of brain cases in dinosaurs because they're often inaccessible, even if it's a well-preserved skull, because, you know, you've got to get inside the skull. Yeah. And it's a CT scan isn't available or you can't fit the skull in the CT scanner or it's full of matrix, which is hard to differentiate from the skull itself, then you'd be difficult to see what the brain case looked like. Yeah. You also get things like it could be distorted through fossilization too, I True. guess. True. Or crushed sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So that's led to this assumption that Tyrannosaur brain cases structures don't have too much variety, but that could just be because we haven't looked at that many. And the authors did say that a lot of Tyrannosaurus rex brain cases have been studied and they have found variety in those. That sounds like a good argument for splitting, because if they have different brains, you'd think they might not be the same species at the very least. Right. You have to be careful, though, because some of those differences could be due to body size or individual variation or Mm -hmm. even the relative maturity, the age of the specimen. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I forgot. (laughs) Dinosaur brains change shape a lot as they grow, which is really different than us. Yeah. In some cases, you can rule out that those factors don't play in and it is something different, but I think it's difficult. With these two Displetosaurus specimens, though, they did find that. They found some differences that can help with this taxonomic distinction. 
One of the examples was the potentially new species of Dyspletosaurus had a bottlenecked olfactory tract. It was very narrow. And that was interesting because that's a trait usually seen in smaller tyrannosaurids. Hmm. Of course, since they're both still thought to be Dyspletosaurus, there were some similarities. And these characters that were found to be similar could be helpful in the future if you're comparing other brain cases. And that can show if a specimen is a type of Dyspletosaurus or maybe a completely different type of Tyrannosaur. So in one of the articles about this paper on phys.org, they said they found, quote, large bony canals that would have transmitted thick nerve bundles that move the eyeballs. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Nerve bundles that moved the eyeballs. I really like how they phrase that. That's weird. Yeah. These brain cases also had large air sacs that they filled up a lot of the bones in the brain case. And that's similar to other tyrannosaurs, at least the ones we know of that have been studied. There were actual air sacs? Yes, air sacs due to diverticula, which I will get more into in our next, in my next news item. Wow. You're really getting into it with the brains. Yeah. It's kind of an accident. <laughs> anyway, these air sacs, they make the skull lighter. They also helped amplify sound and they helped the, quote, system that communicates to the left and right ears. And that would have helped the brain figure out where the sounds were coming from. So, again, they only looked at two brain cases a little bit of backstory on why it was hard to find even two brain cases of the same genus. There's some specimens that were originally referred to Dyspletosaurus that have since been renamed, like Bistahi Verser, which is from the Kirtland Formation in New Mexico. And then there's now Dyspletosaurus Horneri. It used to be thought to be Dyspletosaurus Taurusus, but now it's Horneri, and that one was found in the Two Medicine Formation in Montana. The original description of Dyspletosaurus by Russell in 1970 did establish the taxonomy and describe the anatomy of the holotype, but the author said that some of the other Dyspletosaurus Taurus specimens that were found later couldn't really be compared to the holotype, at least for this study. They were partial postcranial skeletons and non-diagnostic. So that left them with three specimens from Dinosaur Park Formation that they said were eligible for this study to compare to the holotype. In 2003, Phil Curry, who was part of the paper, consider these three specimens to be anatomically distinct from Dyspletosaurus taurusus based on the descriptions of the three specimens, as well as new specimens found in Dinosaur Park Formation or the Oldman Formation. And there's been a few scientists that have suggested that the Dyspletosaurus specimens from Dinosaur Park Formation may be a different species than Dyspletosaurus taurusus. So it's not completely, you know, based on just this one paper that they're describing this new species. This study is another case of need more fossils. The authors wrote at the end of the paper, quote, this description serves as a primer for broader and detailed comparison. Basically, you need more data or a larger data set, and then you can hopefully find more variations within the brain cases of dinosaurs, and then that can also help figure out on a taxonomy level. That's true, although I guess it's going to be really hard if there's so much individual variation and ontogenetic variation as they grow up. With their brains. Yeah, so that's just something to be aware of for these studies in the future. Maybe they can find something that doesn't change much as they age, hopefully. Yeah. So now I guess I'm going to interrupt your <laughs> dinosaur brain papers to talk about two new sauropods. Oh, that's a good reason to interrupt. Yeah. Mix it up a little bit. <laughs> so this new paper was written by Wang Xiaolin and others and published in Scientific Reports, and it includes the first dinosaurs found in what they call the Hami pterosaur fauna. What are sauropods doing in a pterosaur fauna? <laughs> I know. I had to reread it once or twice because the title is literally the first dinosaurs from the early Cretaceous Hami pterosaur fauna. And I was like, wait, that's a pterosaur find. That's not a dinosaur find, but they just call the area the pterosaur fauna, which is kind of weird. Hmm. But the area is in the far northwest of China. It's in the Shengjiko Formation in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and the area is famous for the pterosaur Hamiteris. Makes sense. The Hamiterosaur fauna and the Hamiteris. Yes. Maybe I should say Hami. That's probably how they pronounce it. Some of these Hamiteris individuals are in really incredible condition, which might be why they call it the Hamiterosaur fauna. Mm, yep. Hami Terrace is estimated to be about 120 million years old, which I think is also a good estimate for these new dinosaurs, too, because there were lots of Hami Terrace bones in the mix with these sauropods. 
And like I said, there are two new dinosaurs. There's Hami Titan, Shinjiangensis, and Silu Titan, Sinensis. Hami Titan, you can, I mean, it's just like Hami Terrace, Hami Titan. Mm -hmm. So the Hami, again, refers to Hami City, where it was found, or I guess it could also be the Hami Pterosaur fauna, (laughs) where it was found, but that sounds weird to name a dinosaur after a pterosaur fauna. And then Xinjiang Ensis refers to the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, where it was found. Place name, place source. Yeah, I guess it's place name Titan, place name Ensis (laughs) in this case. Hami Titan includes just seven articulated vertebrae, some of which have partial chevrons, meaning those like things that stick down from the bottom of the tail Mm -hmm. where muscles go by. And the vertebrae in question run from basically the base of the tail to the middle of the tail. So it was only seven vertebrae, but that was most of the length of the tail, they think. So it's a really rough estimate then of how big it might have been. Yes. They estimate that it was about 17 meters or about 56 feet long based on similar dinosaurs that they think it's related to and how long that part of those dinosaurs was because they always, you can actually look at a vertebrae and say like, that looks like it's the fourth caudal vertebrae Mm -hmm. if you really know what you're looking at. And so when they do that, they can compare the size of those bones and how long the articulated series is and get a decent estimate at least. But really, there's probably pretty big error bars on that 17 meters. It's probably like, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 Mm -hmm. in that range. But it does appear to be a titanosaur, and specifically its closest relatives include Notocolossus and Kaiju Titan. Hmm. Those are big ones. Yeah, I mean, they're all sauropods. Most sauropods are big. (laughs) Yeah, But it's certainly not the biggest when you're coming in under 60 feet. But interestingly, when they found Hami Titan, they found it with a theropod tooth, and that was back in 2013. Hmm. So there could be a theropod found in the area, in the pterosaur fauna at some point in the future. And then the other sauropod, like I mentioned, was Silu Titan. And Silu is Mandarin for Silk Road. It's the Silk Road Titan. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then the species name is Sinensis, which means China in Latin, just like all the other Chinese dinosaurs that use Sinensis as a species name. I don't know why. It's like such a missed opportunity. Don't you want to use that species name for something other than sinensis? Just a reminder that species names can overlap. Many, many, many times in some cases. But I think Silu is pretty cool for Silk Road. Mm -hmm. That's a clever connection to make. This one is pretty similar. It's six articulated vertebrae, so one less than in Hami Titan. But these six articulated vertebrae are from the neck. And they basically are from the base to the middle of the neck. So we've got sort of the base to the middle of the tail and the base to the middle of the neck of a different one. And you put them together and you get a full sauropod. Well. You get a part of two different sauropods. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The Silu Titan was actually found with a Hami Terrace jaw back in 2016, a few years more recent than Hami Titan. And based on its features, it looks like it's a close relative of Euhelopus, but they didn't give a size estimate of this one. I guess it's harder to guess from neck vertebrae than it is from tail vertebrae. Mm -hmm. They also tried sticking the two of them together as if they were different parts of the same dinosaur because they were found within about 10 kilometers of one another. Oh, yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, it'd certainly be possible they're at the exact same age in the rock, too, or almost the exact same age. So they certainly could be the same dinosaur. But when they did that, the phylogeny went all weird. Usually when you stick things together that don't belong together, it makes the rest of the tree look super strange. And that's what happened when they stuck these two together. And when they didn't stick them together, they came out in very different parts of the family tree because Hami Titan came out as a titanosaur, which is pretty derived down the family tree, whereas Silu Titan was way farther out, like not a titanosaur, pretty early on the basal branching part of the family tree. Oh, but they still put Titan in the name. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know why they did that. Maybe because they were found together. Maybe. That's a, uh, yeah, now that annoys me. Now that you've pointed it out. Oh, no. The name of things, Titan. Oops. Forget I said that. <laughs> Focus on the Silu. Yeah, the Silu part's cool. Silusaurus sounds a little bit better than Silu Titan. Mm. But anyway, I guess they wanted to make it a Titan. They didn't want one to be a Titan, the other one to just be a Saurus, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Interestingly, they also found a third set of vertebrae. These were four sacral vertebrae that were found in 2008, but unfortunately, they couldn't determine 
if it was an existing genus or if it warranted a new species name. They didn't have enough diagnostic features to go by. So they just call it an indeterminate sauropod. The authors did note, which was pretty weird, that the vertebrae are apparently unfused, and they put apparently, it literally says, quote, apparently unfused, end quote, (laughs) which is weird (laughs) because usually sacral vertebrae are fused. That's essentially what makes them sacral vertebrae, not just back vertebrae or tail vertebrae. It's the fusedness above the hips that gives them that solid structure and makes the sacrum. But they look like sacral vertebrae, I guess, but they're not fused. So I don't know what that's about. But I guess we don't really have to worry about it because it didn't get named. So they can just go in a drawer and wait for someone to find a better version of it mm. than maybe become a referred specimen. Or maybe they'll find more fossils that they can, say, come from this one. Yeah, that's true. Somebody goes back to the site. Mm-hmm. So like I said, all three finds were within a few miles of each other, and all of them have Hami Terrace bones within a few meters as well. So really, it seems like a great place if you're looking for pterosaurs, and an okay place if you're looking for sauropods. And maybe even a place for theropods. Maybe, yeah. They did actually say that there are a few undescribed theropod bones from the area. So maybe someone will stick a few of those together and try to name a genus out of it. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get too much into the details of why they were naming these new species because it's a lot of like the convex and concave nature of different sides of the vertebrae and details like that, which I just didn't want to be throwing out like a half dozen 25 letter words (laughs) to describe the differences between the bones. And unfortunately, it's just vertebrae, so it's nothing exciting. Like we can't talk about the teeth or the head. What do you mean? It's sauropod vertebrae. Of course it's exciting. (laughs) I guess. <laughs> I kind of wonder if these are going to get nomen dubium in the future since they're just vertebrae. But... Uh, but for now, just enjoy. Okay. Enjoy the sauropod goodness. All right. All right, we'll go back to the brains. So this one was published in Science Advances by Christopher Torres and others. And the paper is called Bird Neurocranial and Body Mass Evolution Across the End Cretaceous Mass Extinction, the Avian Brain Shape Left Other Dinosaurs Behind. Oh, no. Those poor other dinosaurs. Well, we know what happened to them. I guess they left them behind at the End Cretaceous yeah, Mass Extinction. They're gone. <laughs> so it could be that this unique brain shape in birds is why birds survived non avian dinosaurs after the mass extinction event. Could be, I guess. Well, okay, that's what this paper is saying. Based on a 70 million year old Ichthyornis fossil with a nearly complete skull. Now, bird skeletons are fragile, so it's hard to find skulls of early birds and relatives. Ichthyornis brain case has been studied in the past, and it was said to be shaped like a modern bird's, but then details in that specimen were obscured. Other brains that have been studied include Archaeopteryx and Cerebavis, but that one, the Cerebavis, was not well preserved. So this ichthyornis skull helps a lot. I don't know how well the Archaeopteryx skulls are preserved either, because they get pretty squished when they're all (laughs) lithographica-y, the way they get preserved. It was good enough to be able to compare the Archaeopteryx one to this ichthyornis one. So the Cerebavis is even worse. Yes. Real quick, as a side note, some things that may have helped animals survive the KPG mass extinction include neuroanatomy, the brains, and feeding ecology. Makes sense. If you're eating something that went extinct, that's going to be a problem. So this paper kind of looked at both, although a lot of the focus was on the brain. Now, birds have more complicated brains than reptiles, other reptiles, and they may have shifted diets and evolved their jaws. Today, there are two clades of modern birds. Paleonaths, which include ratites, flightless birds, as well as these ground-dwelling birds that look like partridges and quail, but they don't fly well, and they prefer to walk and run, and neonaths, which are all other birds. There's fewer than 100 species of paleonaths, and more than 10,000 species (laughs) of neonaths. Yeah, when I think of paleonaths, I mostly think of ostriches and emu, the cassowary. they are the main ones. But I guess there are smaller ones. It's just like dinosaurs. Everyone pays attention to the big ones. Yeah. Now, the reason for this disparity, it's possibly because neonates had better beak adaptability. It's good to have good beak adaptability. You don't want a beak that's unadaptable. It's true. Well, you don't want a 
be unadaptable in any way. Especially around the cr- like extinction, an extinction event. event. Yeah, exactly. So before I get into the brain parts, the authors found that the jaws and palates, kind of the roof of the mouth alone, didn't help much probably when it came to birds surviving the extinction event. They also looked at avian body mass evolution and said that they couldn't find any patterns that showed that small body masses, the smaller birds, helped extant birds survive. So the size didn't really have anything to do with it. Wow, that's super weird. Almost all the previous studies show a pretty strong correlation between bigger things going extinct and smaller things surviving. So they did say this could change with future discoveries because they looked at a lot of fragmentary specimens and Specimens where the phylogeny is not well understood. So, hashtag need more fossils. <laughs> yeah. All right, on to the brain parts. So, the team used CT scans. They made a partial 3D replica of the brain, an endocast, and they compared it to endocasts of modern birds and more distant non avian dinosaur relatives like Archaeopteryx. And they found that the brain shape was more similar to Archaeopteryx than to extant modern birds. Interesting. Yeah. So they looked at the Wulst, W-U-L-S-T. It's a bulge in the front of the skull. And they said it had a quote unquote incipient Wulst. That's quite a phrase, incipient Wulst. Yeah, which means it was small. The Wulst, but a bigger Wulst, is in modern birds. And the idea is it's a feature that helped birds survive. So it does make sense that it was smaller in species that did not survive the extinction event. In modern birds, living birds, it's unique to birds among reptiles, and it corresponds to a part of the brain that's thought to be similar to parts of the mammalian neocortex. That's the part of the brain for language, sensory perception, cognition, spatial reasoning, generating motor commands, lots of stuff. Interesting. And other brains look very different, but they can do a lot of similar, at least some birds can, do a lot of similar tasks and puzzle Oh, yeah. Solving things. There's some very smart birds out there. But they have a totally different brain structure that does it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, there was a similar feature tentatively found in Archaeopteryx, but that turned out to be a taphonomic artifact. Oh, interesting. So just something that happened while it was fossilizing. Yeah. Now, the presence of a wolst has been suggested to help show the ability to fly, at least if you're looking at it from a brain point of view. In addition to all those other things, pretty in important little Bulge. incipient wolst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, because it's incipient in ichthyornis, it's smaller than the wolst in modern birds. And ichthyornis didn't make it through the KPG boundary? No. Right? I guess okay. the wolst was too small. Oh, it didn't have enough wolst. <laughs> that should have been the title of their paper. Ichthyornis didn't have enough wolst. Uh, then you'd have to know what a wolst is ahead of time. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. So we have other types of news because there's always dinosaur stuff going on. There's some students from the University of Alberta that's looking for help in excavating a hadrosaur. The specimen was found in 2018. It was in a hill. It's in a remote area between Tolman Bridge and Drumheller. But it's about three kilometers, almost two miles of a hike away from their campsite. So that makes it very difficult to bring back where they have the trucks they could load it onto. And the hadrosaur is in this top-down position. It's not lying down. Ugh. It's very large. It's very heavy. Each jacket weighs about 120 pounds. Those are actually relatively small jackets as far as dinosaur jackets go. But in terms of carrying that two miles. Yeah, that's probably why they're ma- jacketing them in small fragments like that. But that also probably means that they have a lot of those jackets to carry. Mm-hmm. So ideally, they'd like to use a boat and then walk the fossils along the river to their camp, and then they can load it onto the truck. I'm looking for volunteers to help somebody who can help them get a boat. Who's got a boat? Yeah. (laughs) Bring it to the dinosaur. We'll share a link to the article in our show notes, and that article has an email to reach Mark Powers, who's leading the team, in case you have a boat (laughs) or access to a boat. Looking for an Albertan with a boat. Yep. Moving to another part of the world, in Melbourne, Museums Victoria is looking for people, if you live in Victoria, Australia, you can vote for a state fossil emblem, or at least a candidate for a state fossil emblem. Is a fossil emblem analogous to like a state fossil or a city fossil? I think so. Interesting. Because Victoria has a few emblems already. That includes the helmeted honey eater, which is a bird. 
That's a good name. A weedy sea dragon. It's a marine animal. It's another good name. And then gold, mineral. That's boring. But, <laughs> but they don't have a fossil emblem yet. And you can choose from eight nominees. They were all found in Victoria. One is a dinosaur, Laelanosaurus. That's a good one. Yeah. The nominees were chosen based on, you know, the fossils are distinct. They were unique to Victoria or Victoria had the best or most complete specimen of this fossil. They're significant to science and they're something that the public would get excited about. (laughs) (laughs) I see, because there's probably like a bunch of unique fossilized bivalves from Victoria. (laughs) And they're like, yeah, they're unique. They're only here. We've got some really good ones, but (laughs) could be. I will not be naming our state fossil after a bivalve. People don't want to vote if it's nothing exciting. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They had a panel of paleontologists, geologists, and scientists to choose the candidates. So if you live in Victoria and Australia, you can vote from now until October 4th. You can also see all the nominees on display at the 600 Million Years Exhibition in Melbourne Museum's Science and Life Gallery from now until October 4th. The winner will be announced and then submitted to the government for official endorsement, but the timeline is a bit unclear, so I don't know how long it will take. Yeah, and once you submit it, who knows how long things take. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that exhibit is really good, the 600 Million Years Exhibition in the Melbourne Museum. That's where they have basically all the holotypes. That's where you see like Laelanosaura and I think Diluvicursor and all Mm -hmm. those ones, all those little tiny ornithopods that they found down in Victoria. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And then last, in Japan, Tokyo Dome, which is a concert venue, has a dinosaur exhibition where they've got a bunch of recreations of dinosaur skeletons, some that were excavated by Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum. They also have a life-size animatronic T-Rex and a large screen that shows videos of T-Rex and Triceratops fighting. Some of the dinosaurs on display include T-Rex, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus, Suchomimus, Fukui Venator, or Fukui Venator. Yeah, I can tell which one you prefer based mm. on the how much emphasis you put into the venator <laughs> versus the venator. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there's Fukui Raptor. So this exhibit's open from now until September 5th. You do have to wear masks. Only a certain number of tickets are available each day. Interesting. There is a very decided bias towards carnivores in that list. Yeah. I think there's only two herbivores out of eight yeah that's a good point and then they have a big display of a t-rex trying to eat a triceratops just to add to the it said they're fighting it doesn't say who's winning (laughs) (laughs) the carnivores always win at these battles and not always sometimes you get a feisty herbivore i suppose the sauropods sometimes make it out no yeah they do i guess it's not fighting a hadrosaur if it was a hadrosaur you know there's no way they ever depict the hadrosaur escaping with its life I don't think we see those fights too often depicted. Is Tenontosaurus getting chewed on by Nanonychus? That's usually oh, what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. We've seen many statues, bloody statues. <laughs> yeah. Tenontosaurus is just there to be depicted being eaten by Deinonychus. Well, to be fair, a lot of them probably were eaten. Yeah. But I mean, so were a lot of meat eaters by other meat eaters, but that, they don't show that very often. That's true. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Aerosteon, which was a request from Paleo Mike 716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Aerosteon was a megaraptoran that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Mendoza province in Argentina in the Plottier Formation. It was bipedal, it had an elongated skull, strong legs and tail, and large claws. The initial estimates were that it was about 33 feet or 10 meters long. Oof. But then later, it was estimated to be about 20 feet or 6 meters long and weigh 1,100 pounds, 500 kilograms. That's according to Gregory Paul. And then Molina Perez and Larmendi estimated Aerosteon to be 25 feet or 7.5 meters long and weigh 2,200 pounds or one metric ton. That's a lot smaller. Some variation, though. But yeah. The type species is Aerosteon rio coloradens. And the genus name means airbone in Greek. The species name refers to it being found 0.6 miles or about a kilometer north of the Rio Colorado. The species name was originally Rio Coloradensis, but then it was changed to Rio Coloradens to match. It was a neuter gender, it said. Yeah, that's interesting. I would have thought it'd be Rio Coloradensis too, but I guess 
if it doesn't have a gender in Latin, then it's just then it just ends in ints. Yeah, feels a little strange to say because we don't have that too often. Mm-hmm. So the fossils were found in 1996. It took many years to clean and CT scan. And then it was first described in 2008 by Paul Serino and others. But at the time, the ICZN didn't recognize new species as valid if it was only published online, which is where it was. So in 2009, PLOS One worked with ICZN to make it a valid name. The Hubble type includes skull bones, neck and back vertebrae, some ribs, gastralia, furcula, the wishbone, shoulder bone, and more. And these bones weren't fully fused, so it probably wasn't an adult specimen. Aerosteon is part of Megaraptora. That's a group that slightly built advanced allosauroids that had large hand claws. When it was named, Aerosteon didn't fall into any of the three known groups, the abelosaurids, spinosaurids, carcharodontosaurids that had been found in South America from the Cretaceous. So Aerosteon, according to the paper, quote, represents a distinctive basal tetanurin lineage that has survived into the late Cretaceous on South America and is possibly linked to the allosauroid radiation of the Jurassic. What's really interesting about Aerosteon is the fossils show a bird-like respiratory system. We've got a bird theme going on in this episode. <laughs> it had some pneumatic bones, including in the furcula, the wishbone, and ilium, and some gastralia. That's a lot of pneumaticity. Yeah, especially the gastralia. So the authors suggested that Aerostan's respiratory system may have helped regulate body temperature, and then that later would have helped with more efficient breathing. This respiratory system could have helped it with hunting, you know, helping with running long distances, as well as helping it cool down. Now, based on the pneumaticity of some of the gastralia, it may mean it had air tubes under the skin to help with the cooling. The pneumaticity would also probably have helped it balance. You know, its upper body weighed less, so it's less likely to fall over when it's chasing prey. That's always a good thing. Yeah. Aerostan may have had a similar air sac system to modern birds, where the air sacs moved air in and out. And we talked about this, Garrett did in episode 346, about a new heterodontosaurus specimen that helped show how ornithischians, ornithischians breathe. Now, birds are efficient breathers. Just to recap, they've got this unidirectional airflow, and breathing in fills the air sacs, and breathing out empties the air sacs, and the lungs always fill from the back. And that's what makes it unidirectional. Now, the lungs stay full the whole time, and that's more efficient, and with birds, that helps them with flying. So, aerostaon may have helped show how birds' respiratory systems evolved. From the original paper in 2008, they said that the fossil evidence of the origin and evolution of air sacs is limited, since lungs don't fossilize, and because the air sacs in modern birds rarely pneumatize their bones and leave evidence that they existed. But in aerostaon, Bones were pneumatized by diverticulae of air sacs. I knew that word came up. It didn't come up in our news item. It came up in our dinosaur today. Anyway, so the air sac pouches led to hollowness in the bones. They suggested a four-phase model of the evolution of air sacs and respiratory system in birds based on this. And they said phase one, there's more air sacs along the neck in basal theropods no later than in the earliest Triassic. Phase two, the air sacs differentiated in the Jurassic to include clavicle and abdominal air sacs. These air sacs could be used as bellows, which may mean that there were rigid lungs with that flow through ventilation like modern birds. Yeah, you need the air sacs in the back because then those fill up in the breathing in with the fresh air. And then the air sacs in the front fill up in the breathing in also with the air that was previously in the lungs. Mm -hmm. And then when they breathe out, it can use both sets of air sacs at once. Just so efficient. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so then phase three, there's this primitive air pump with the sternum and ribs that evolved in manoraptoriforms before the end of the Jurassic. And then phase four, the advanced air pump evolved in manoraptorans before the end of the Jurassic. Yeah. And when you say sternum and ribs, I think they're also talking about gastralia there because mm -hmm. that was the unique thing about theropods that they had, whereas the ornithischians had to come up with something else. Yep. So it's not clear from Aerostaon when unidirectional lung ventilation occurred, you know, the way it breathed. They haven't identified through bones if there's uni or bidirectional lung ventilation. Yeah, we're really lucky that 
their, like you said, the bones were even invaded by the lungs, or I should say the air sacs at all, so that we know there was that pneumaticity. It left marks, yeah. Yeah, if they were like modern birds, we wouldn't have anything in the fossil record, probably. So, turns out there was some controversy between the authors and Matt Wadel, who posted on SV Pow about the findings of Aerostayon. Wadel wrote, quote, there's no question that the fossil material is pretty stunning, end quote, but there's parts of the paper that he disagreed with, and he ended up having a three-part blog post. And he talked about how only living tetrapods with postcranial pneumaticity are birds. And he said how in 2005, this is kind of laying the groundwork for this argument, that O'Connor and Clayson's injected and dissected over 200 birds, and they found cervical diverticula never went further down than the middle of the thorax. So in dinosaurs, pneumatic vertebrae further down the body probably were from the abdominal air sacs. Because again, we're talking about there's two parts. There's the clavicle and the abdominal parts to it. With dinosaurs having pneumaticity all over the body shows that they had the cervical, clavicle, and abdominal air sacs, which means that they had air sacs around the lungs, and that means they were at least somewhat equipped to have the flow through breathing like birds. Wadle disagreed with Sereno and all, saying that cervical air sacs have been found past the thorax in birds, and he said that the Aerostayon's papers claimed that they hadn't been was based on previous papers where those authors didn't actually say cervical air sacs went past the thorax. It turns out pneumatization happened from abdominal air sacs, and Wadle said that the Aerostayon paper was dismissive of the O'Connor and Clayson's 2005 paper where they, you know, dissected the 200 birds and came to these findings. Another thing Wadel didn't agree with was the use of the word pleurocele because he said it was too broad of a term. This word is, according to him, for, quote, big pneumatic cavities that are often present in the vertebral centra of sauropods and theropods, end quote. And that's been used to mean multiple things, which can lead to confusion. He was saying instead of using the word plural seal in the paper, that they should have replaced it with the words pneumatic foramina. And that means that the pneumatic cavity leads to internal chambers. So yeah. it's a little more specific. I didn't realize that was exactly what that meant. Yeah. That's very useful. Now you know. <laughs> He also, Wadel also defined pneumatic hiatus, which was a coin that he termed in 2003. And he also came out with a paper shortly after the Aerostayon paper came out, which I think is partly what led him to write these blog posts. He even said he was kind of biting his tongue in some of these <laughs> because it was before his paper came out. But uh, his 2009 paper said, quote, pneumatic Hiatuses are gaps in the pneumatization of the vertebral column and indicate pneumatization from multiple sources, end mm. quote. So it's basically gaps where there aren't hollow areas, and that means the hollow areas were a result of multiple sources. Yeah, because otherwise they would be all in a row. If it was coming from the same place, mm -hmm. it would invade all of the nearby bones and not take random gaps. Yes. Now, in the paper about Aerostayon, the author said, so risky in adults and juveniles do not show a pneumatic hiatus. And Wadle said, well, neither do adult birds, because birds have up to three sets of diverticula in the cervical air sacs, lungs, and abdominal air sacs, and they meet up, so then you get this continuous pneumatic foramina down the vertebral column. That's true. Birds are chock full of air sacs. Yes. Now, in juvenile birds, you see gaps or pneumatic hiatus because these sets haven't met up yet. Interesting. They were saying that this dinosaur could be a juvenile. It's true. Which I guess could mean maybe it did reach that 30-foot length when it was fully grown. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. Anyway, so Wadle didn't agree with the part about it being difficult to defend this idea of having three different pneumatic sources that resulted in one pleurocele or as he would have called it, pneumatic foramina, in Aerostayon. He also didn't agree when the author said it was problematic to directly compare birds to non-avian dinosaurs when it comes to pneumaticity in the posterior axial column. In other words, the end of the 
vertebrae. The axial column is like a weird way to say the spine. Mm Mm-hmm. And he also said that the absence of the pneumatic hiatus is not evidence that there was only one source or route to that bone being pneumatized. And he said that not enough dinosaurs have been analyzed for pneumatic hiatus. Not everyone works on pneumaticity. Also, we only coined the term in 2003, so at this point, 2008, not much time had passed by the time Aristeum was named to look for pneumatic hiatus in dinosaurs. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, people don't always publish about the absence of something. Mm -hmm. So pointing out which bones don't have (laughs) pneumatic foramina isn't going to be a big highlight of a paper usually. Yes. So he pointed out all these things that he disagreed with. And then Serena responded and said it was a, quote, misleading, long-winded ad hominem critique of this paper. (laughs) And then that led to Wade all responding. So that's why I'm (laughs) saying this was a bit controversial. (laughs) Now, again... After the Aristeon paper came out a few months later, that's when Wadle's 2009 paper came out. It was the third chapter of his dissertation. It was published and it was about evidence for bird-like air sacs in Ceriscian dinosaurs and pneumatic hiatuses, which is why he, he kept bringing that up. Hmm. Now, back to other things about Aristeon. There was an isolated tooth referred to Aristeon, but later found to be the tooth of an abelosaurid. A close relative to Aristeon is Murus raptor, which was described in 2016, that had less pneumatic bones. And it was the authors who described Murus raptor found that the isolated tooth referred to Aristeon was similar to an abelosaur tooth that may have been scavenging on the Aristeon carcass. Interesting. Yep. But the two, Murus raptor and Aristeon, had very similar skull bones and vertebrae, which is why they're close relatives. And our fun fact of the day is about tyrannosaurs, and specifically about how strong their bite forces were, because this seems to be the thing that everybody likes to study. Mm -hmm. Just how strong could tyrannosaurs bite? How many bones could it crush? The answer is a lot. (laughs) (laughs) But in this case, we're looking at Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus. There's a new paper from the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences by Francois Therian and others, and they're looking at Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus specifically, not T-Rex, and whether or not it went through a dietary shift as it grew up, just like how T-Rex did. Spoiler alert, they did. (laughs) (laughs) But the interesting thing is how they figured this out. Just for a real quick aside, Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus are usually in a two-member group called Albertosaurinae. So I'm going to mention Albertosaurinae and Albertosaurines a bunch, and that basically is just a shorthand way of saying Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus, which is all they were looking at in this paper. But there are quite a few samples of Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus skulls, or at least partial skulls, that could be used for this analysis, because the main thing they're looking at is a cross-section of the jaw to see basically how tall it is and how like beefy it is, <laughs> and then estimating how long it is, so that way you can get the estimate of the forces, because if it's really long, even if it's the same thickness as something that's shorter, you get more force, twisting force on the thing. <laughs> so you have to compare both the length and sort of the girth of the jaw in order to figure out how strong it is. So Albertosaurines are a little bit older than T-Rex, usually by a couple million years. They're basically around like the 70 million year old mark, whereas T-Rex is more like 67. Thereabouts, I mean, it all varies because all these species were around for a couple million years. But Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and T-Rex were all similar in size until they were about 10 years old. But then T-Rex had a way bigger growth spurt Hmm. and just left the rest of them in the dust in terms of size. And that's why it's the apex. It is. But I mean... Since they didn't coexist much at yeah, all. Yeah, that's true. Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus were probably the apex predators of their area, but T Rex ended up being about two to three times heavier than the Albertosaurines at full size. So, yes, it was the apex of the apex. That's why it's the king mm-hmm. <laughs> or the Rex. So, the authors of the paper looked at a proportional change in that skull over time. Unfortunately, You can't tell from watching a single individual, which is really like any sort of modern paper where we're looking at extant animals. I mean, not modern paper, modern animals. We're looking at extant animals, living animals, and you're trying to figure out how something changes over time. You watch an animal over time, but you can't do that with the fossil record. So you have to just find different animals that died and fossilized at different times Mm -hmm. and sort of presume 
that if the one that died when it was a year old kept living, it would eventually look like the one that died when it was 25 years old, Mm -hmm. which is a big presumption. Right, because there's so much individual variation. Yeah, and you're not even often coming from a bone bed where it's like one group of dinosaurs. Very often it's an Albertosaurus from like Alberta, and then you've got another one from Wyoming or... Mm -hmm. Montana or something and you're comparing those because that's just the best that we can do. Yeah. Which means there's quite a bit of noise and individual variation between them because they might be living, eating slightly different things. They might have different pressures. They might have been a million years apart in time. Right. They could have even been different species or subspecies, but we just can't tell from the fossil record. Some might have had easy access to food. Some didn't. That would have affected their growth. Absolutely. But Even when you have all that variability, they did find a pretty consistent trend where basically for the first 10 years, they're growing pretty slowly, similar to a lot of other dinosaurs. And then around 10 years old, they have this huge growth spurt, at least with T-Rex. And I'm sort of assuming that this estimate of jaw length correlates to age the way it does with T-Rex and with Albertosaurines. So just like T-Rex, the Albertosaurines started out with a longer, narrower skull a nanotyrannus type skull, Mm -hmm. if you will. (laughs) (laughs) I see what you're doing. (laughs) And it later grew into a much deeper and more powerful head that we're all used to seeing with T-Rex. They also found that when the mandible reached about 58 centimeters, so that's the jaw reaching about two feet, the teeth switched from a more knife-like tooth to a thicker and therefore more capable of bone crushing tooth. For reference, a full-grown individual Albertosaurine is about 100 centimeters or just over three feet, whereas a full-grown T-Rex is about 120 centimeters or four feet. That's that's big. (laughs) Yeah, they're big skulls for sure. And this is really just the mandible, but that is essentially most of the length, if not all of the length of the skull too. So in order to compare the Albertosaurines, they plotted the maximum bending strength of the jaw on the Y-axis against the length of the jaw on the x-axis. The Albertosaurines were as strong as T-Rex when they were the same size, meaning that T-Rex and Albertosaurines were proportionately about as strong, but it was that increase in size that gave T-Rex its extra bite force. In other words, if Albertosaurines went through the same massive growth spurt that T-Rex did, they likely would have achieved similar bite forces to T-Rex. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because I hadn't seen that analyzed before yeah but possibly even more interesting is they also compared the bending strength of the jaw to other theropods with these tyrannosaurs and then they're looking at all the tyrannosaurs not just the albertosaurines because again they found that they had a pretty similar trajectory but basically the albertosaurines just didn't get as big so they don't make it all the way up to the higher sizes Hmm. so like i mentioned When they reach about two feet long or 58 centimeters, the teeth switched from that knife-like to a thicker, more capable of bone crushing type tooth. Right around that same time or same length at about 60 centimeters, the relative strength or resisting to bending of the jaw starts skyrocketing too. Hmm. So it it looks like that probably aligns. It looks exactly like that car paper where he's showing the growth spurt Mm -hmm. in tyrannosaurs where they're really small. And then you see them put on a ton of weight in their teenage years. It looks just like that exact same S curve with like a slow start, then a massive spurt, and then it tapers off at the end. Hmm. But it's in this case, we're looking at the strength of the jaw. Right. So it aligns with the size of the overall individual. That makes sense. And it also aligns with the change in teeth from slicing to more of a crushing shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all it all aligns nicely. It's nice when that works out. It doesn't always happen. That's true. And then it's like, what are these dinosaurs doing? They're so weird. But need more papers. This makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice when it makes sense. So basically, under 60 centimeters or two feet, tyrannosaurs were similar to most other theropods in terms of their jaw strength. So they're similar to things like Dilophosaurus and Dromaeosaurids or raptors, and they had those similar teeth again to match. Because of this, the authors think that below 60 centimeters, the Albertosaurines and Tyrannosaurids in general probably hunted smaller prey, but then above 60 centimeters, they're probably switching to larger prey or mega herbivores, as people like to call them, like Hadrosaurs and Ceratopsids. The ones that would be dangerous for them to go after when they're too small. Yeah, and they just didn't even have the right, they weren't the right size, they didn't have the right jaw, they didn't have the right teeth. It's really all about adapting to the circumstances. So, random thought, I was just thinking about how in Land Before Time, 
I think it's Land Before Time 2, and they have Chomper, who's the baby T-Rex. Chopper's their friend, but, you know, Land Before <laughs> Time, I think they're always juveniles, so yeah. they never had to deal with this change. <laughs> you could have that. Yeah, they could be friends when they're little, and mm-hmm. then it grows up and it tries to eat your face. <laughs> that is what happens. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Puberty, man. Yeah, especially with Tyrannosaurus putting on, like, 6,000 pounds of weight. Mm-hmm. So for the comparisons with other theropods, this was one of my favorite parts of it. Giganotosaurus, I often see referenced as like the African T-Rex, but Giganotosaurus with its 170 centimeter jaw (laughs) plus or uh, over five and a half feet is only about as strong as a Tyrannosaurid's jaw when it's about 80 centimeters or under three feet long, which is far from the largest T-Rex size, obviously. Yep. And that's where Giganotosaurus basically tops out in terms of its jaw strength. And it's got a T-Rex has a very fitting name. Mm Mm-hmm. It does. Also, at the same length, so if you're taking the exact same length for multiple different dinosaur types, a full-grown T-Rex jaw is about 10 times as strong as a fully grown (laughs) Suchomimus, which is the only Spinosaurid in the data set. So, you know, 10 times as strong as as a Spinosaur in terms of biting power. And specifically what this is about is that resistance to twisting, which is what you'd have happen if you're either biting something really hard, it's going to start to twist your jaw, or if you're fighting something rather than just like nipping at it and then scampering away. Or, you know, if you're eating fish, you don't have to worry about it much either. Mm. Also at the same length, a T-Rex jaw is about four times as strong as an Acrocanthosaurus jaw. But there is one outlier, and that's the abelosaurids, so Carnotaurus and Majungasaurus, which were stronger at the same length than Tyrannosaurids. Might be a little surprising, because it's like they're not supposed to have super strong jaws. Right. But the interesting thing about it is, on the graph, they're pretty far to the left. They're well before that inflection point at 60 centimeters, where the Tyrannosaur jaws start getting super strong. So this is basically the comparison of a pretty young Tyrannosaurid that hasn't started getting its specialized jaws yet to a Carnotaurus, which has a really weirdly specialized head. You know, they're very short front to back, and that also gives you that advantage of it doesn't have a long jaw, so it can handle the stress better in that way. Hmm. But overall, aside from the one outlier of Abelosaurids when Tyrannosaurs are very young, it again confirms how amazing Tyrannosaurids are. The king. (laughs) They really are, especially when it comes to bite force and jaws that resist twisting for that extra strength when you're biting something really difficult to get through. It's pretty impressive. That is. And if you're a fan of Gorgosaurus or Albertosaurus, they're not really any lesser than T-Rex. They just didn't get quite as big. Right. They still did all the stuff. And they, up until age 10, they were all very similar. Yeah. That's a rough random estimate, by the way. 10-ish. <laughs> okay. Up, up until 10-ish. Before becoming an adult. Yeah. Before T-Rex went through the growth spurt that just vastly outpaces them. They were holding their own. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you want to join our growing community of dinosaur enthusiasts, go to patreon.com slash I Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.